good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Arnold. I'm the Agriculture Extension Agent for Consumer Horticulture here in Buncombe County. We want to thank you for joining us for our program today. Welcome to Saturday Seminar Presents Managing Bad Bugs in Your Vegetable Garden, Lessons from the Learning Garden. We are so glad you could join us today. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Laura Brooks. Laura is an Extension Master Gardener and also the co-chair of the Vegetable Plot in the Learning Garden, located here at the Buncombe County Extension Office. Laura will be talking to us today about the three most common pests that were encountered last year in the Learning Garden, squash vine borers, flea beetles, and Mexican bean beetles. She'll explain a little bit about the life cycle of these insects and organic methods that the Master Gardeners use to help control these insects. So thank you, and Laura, you have the stage. Good morning. Thank you, Allison, very much for that wonderful introduction. I've been a master gardener here in Buncombe County for about five years now. And I just have to say that I work with the greatest group of people that I can ever imagine being with. And one of them is Barb Harrison. Barb has been my friend, my mentor, my co-worker, and completely invaluable in putting together this presentation. I certainly could not have done it without her. She's amazing, and she's going to be with me at the end of our discussion today, helping to answer your questions, because I know that you're going to ask me a few that I won't have the answers to. I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to tackle the three worst pests we encountered in the vegetable learning garden over the past couple of years, but boy, we had some doozies last year. I know this has been an interesting year for all of us. Between pandemic and politics, the one thing that's helped me stay centered is having that extra time to spend in my garden. I've even found peace in pulling weeds. And believe me, this is a first. When I was a little girl, my mother would pay me a penny a weed for pulling them out of our little center court garden in our house. Didn't take me long at all to realize there wasn't anything in the world I needed that cost more than 25 cents because that's as far as my attention span went or how many weeds I wanted to pull. If you're at all like me, I know one thing that'll disrupt my peace and tranquility is coming into the garden first thing in the morning to find out that the pests have invaded overnight and already are starting to destroy everything we've worked so hard on these past few months. I can't believe we're already late into June. So you may be seeing some of these pests already. It may be too late to put into practice some of the things we're going to talk about, but hopefully you can tuck this information away for next year, and hopefully, unlike me, you'll be able to find out where you tucked it. The three major pests we encounter year after year are the squash vine borer, the flea beetle, and the Mexican bean beetle. We're going to be discussing their life cycles, the appearance of these bugs, organic methods for control, and just a couple of chemical methods for control. First, the squash vine borer. Every time I see this slide, it reminds me of a really bad disease from an anatomy class that I had in college. I don't think I've ever met a gardener who hasn't planted squash or gourd sometimes in their lives. So my guess is that all of you are familiar with the squash vine borer, but if you're not, you soon will be. This slide is a section of the stem of a squash plant with the borer there in the center, making its way from the roots out towards the leaves. How can you tell if you've been attacked by the squash vine borer? Well, it's pretty easy, and it's usually too late if your plants look anything like this. The slide on the left here is what we call frass. Now, if you're not familiar with what frass is, to put it delicately, I call it the byproduct from when an insect or a borer has eaten your plant and what is left. Over on this side, this probably a few days ago was a very healthy and beautiful squash plant. And you can see that right now it is completely wilted. The adult squash vine borer is a moth and they usually make their first appearance between late May and early June. You'll see them fluttering around your squash plants 
and they look like a small wasp. They have an orange abdomen with black dots on it. Their wings, you can't really see very well from this, but their wings are a metallic green and they have very long antennae. These moths come out and fly around during the day, whereas most moths fly at night. Another moth that flies during the day is one of my favorites, and that's the hummingbird moth. I love to see those come out. Let's go over the life cycle of the squash vine borer. The moths overwinter underground as pupa. They emerge in late May to the 1st of June and come out as the adult. And then they'll lay one egg at a time at the base of your squash plant, either on the stem or on the ground. The eggs will hatch in about a week and then the larvae bore into the stem of your plant and this begins their destructive journey. They'll feed for about four weeks and then they burrow out of the plant back into the soil up to two inches deep where they'll pupate and live until next year. The larvae are what cause all of the destruction. They'll feed through the center of your plant going from the roots up towards the leaves. This disrupts the flow of water to the leaves and that's what causes the wilt. So what can we do about them? There are a couple things we can do that don't involve chemicals. This is one of the things we did last year and we're doing it again this year and I've done it in my garden at home. We use a physical barrier. As a matter of fact, this is one of our little squash plants right out in the garden. I used plastic cups to make a collar around the squash plant so that the moth can't come down and fly to the base and lay its eggs where it wants to. This is two cups. This little red cup was where I started the plant. I cut the bottom out of the cup, settled the cup into a small pot of soil where I wanted to start the plant and put the seed in the cup. I covered it with a little soil. When the plant emerged, it came up through the cup. One of the things that happened here was the cup was so small, when this plant emerged, you can see these leaves, the cotyledons, these are the first leaves that come out. They were so large that they pushed the cup right off the plant. Well, that wouldn't do any good whatsoever. So luckily I started it in a pot at home. I put the cup back on, but when I got out to the garden to plant it, I realized that it wasn't tall enough. You need to have at least two inches of height to protect your squash vine from those moths. Here you can see they used a paper cup. You can use paper cup. If you have paper towels, the inside of the paper towel roll. If you're lucky enough to have toilet paper, you can use your toilet paper roll. I just prefer the plastic cups because the paper rolls disintegrate pretty quickly. You can use aluminum foil and make a collar. I had a friend who successfully used pantyhose to wrap the stem of her plant and the pantyhose allowed the plant to grow without constricting its growth. Laura, can you describe a little bit more about the aluminum foil at the base of the plant? Does it need to go below the soil level? Yes, it does. Anything you use as a protective barrier needs to be nestled into the soil because the moths will lay their eggs either on the stem or at the soil line right by the stem. So it needs to be nestled down into the soil so they can't get to them. Now there are different things you can do here too. You can choose different varieties of squash. For some reason, the squash vine borer prefers a straight neck squash over the crook neck squash. And it's been shown that both butternut and crenshaw seem to be more resistant to the squash vine borer than other varieties. You can plant a trap crop. Well, what is a trap crop? It is just what it says it is. It's a trap. Insects, just like you and me, have certain things they like better than other things. The squash vine borer really prefers Hubbard squash over any other variety. So what you could do is find a place in the corner of your garden that's away from where you're going to be planting your squash you want to eat and put in a Hubbard squash or two. That's where the squash vine borer will head to first. You can use colored traps. You can purchase yellow sticky traps at your local garden supply place or you can create your own traps. Get some yellow plastic cups, put a little bit of water in them, set them around your garden, and the moths will 
head towards those cups. They like the color yellow because it's the color of the flowers. And they'll fly down in them and drown. Bacillus thuringiensis are a naturally occurring bacterium, but it has to be eaten to cause mortality. So your application has to be generous and consistent so that the larvae will ingest it. You put that at the base of your plant and on the soil. And then be sure to till the soil after every season to expose and kill the pupae. A wise man once said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think it was Benjamin Franklin. Another thing you can do, floating row covers will stop the adults from laying their eggs on your plants. Now, this says remove the covers at first bloom, but you don't have to do that because the first blossoms that come out on a squash plant are all male. You can tell the difference between the male and the female flowers because the males come out around the perimeter of the squash plant and they're on very long stems and they're the larger of the flowers. The female flowers will be at the center of the plant and on very short stems and that's where your fruit is going to develop. You can outweigh the squash vine borer by planting summer squash in July. It makes sense because the moths emerge from mid-May to early June. They lay their eggs. The eggs take a week to hatch. You have four weeks of feeding till they pupate. And so that would put you between the first week of July and July the 7th. If you start some seeds July the 1st, the larvae will be leaving the plants and going into the soil to pupate and your plants will have July, August, and September to grow and produce because our last average frost date here in Buncombe County isn't until mid-October. Now you can use neem oil. Neem smothers the eggs, but the timing is very important. You have to catch the eggs. You apply it to the plant stems, not the leaves, and remember to always spray in the late evening or at night. There's another question about tilling at the end of the season, if that would help with these pests. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It will help with all of your pests. It's particularly good for the pupae, for the squash vine borers that are in the soil. Thank you, Laura. Here we are, next little critter of destruction, the flea beetle. A couple quick facts about the flea beetles. They will attack many vegetables. These include the brassicas, or your cabbage family, such as radishes, turnips, broccoli, to name a few. They like the nightshade family of potatoes, tomatoes, peppers. And what I think their all-time favorite is the eggplant. But they'll also feast on spinach, melons, and sweet corn. One plant I would like to add to this list, tomatillos. I forgot about those and I planted my tomatillos a couple weeks ago. It didn't take more than three days for the flea beetles to attack them. Luckily, they're recovering. There are several species of flea beetles with each one having their own preferred diet. Most of the beetles are very tiny, only about a 16th to an eighth of an inch long, with the exception of the spinach flea beetle, which is about a quarter of an inch long. And they come in all colors black, bronze, brown, bluish, and even metallic gray. And some of them even have stripes. One thing they all have in common, the flea beetles have strong legs and they will jump if you even look at them sideways. Now on this slide, you can see some of our flea beetles that have stripes. The adults feed on the leaves and the stems of your plant, making small holes. This slide over here on our bottom left, I think at one time was an eggplant, but it's really hard to tell at this point because they've turned it into what looks like very old lace. To understand the flea beetle, let's look at their life cycle. The flea beetles overwinter as adults in leaf litter, wooded areas, hedgerows, and windbreaks, which pretty much mean anywhere in our area. They emerge with quite the appetite and nothing looks better to them than all those beautiful plants that we have so lovingly tended in our garden. But here's a tip. Plants started from seed are less tolerant to flea beetle damage than transplants, but both can be severely damaged. The bigger the plant, the stronger the plant, and thus are more able to withstand the damage done by the flea beetles. 
The females lay their eggs in small holes in the roots or on the leaves or on the soil around their preferred plant. Small white larvae will then hatch and go on to feed on the roots of your plant. The larvae transform into pupae, which then will grow into the adult. The flea beetles will produce one to two generations a year, and then ending their life cycle as an adult where they go back and overwinter. It's the adult flea beetle that does the most damage by feeding on the leaves and the stems. They create pits, small holes, Usually the holes are only an eighth of an inch, but the severe damage can stunt and kill your plants. Also makes eating your spinach or kale very unappealing. A couple things that we can do to help protect our crops from these very annoying pests. Rotate your crop. Colby Griffin, an extension agent in Franklin County, summed it up very well by saying, a combination of cultural practices and physical barriers work the best. Rotate your crops, set out larger transplants, and then water and fertilize your plants to encourage growth. Clean up the garden in the fall to prevent the habitat for the overwintering adults. There's a question also about rotating crops. How far do you actually need to move the plant? You just don't want it in the same spot you had. You, you, you know that you can't plant your tomatoes in the same place. You don't want to plant your peas and beans in the same spot. So just picture yourself a different plot. And as far as distance goes, as long as it's not in the same soil, you should be in pretty good shape. But I imagine the further away you can get, the better. Thank you, Laura. Here's a physical barrier that we used last year in the garden. I have used it at home and it worked very well. This eggplant we brought into the garden and planted when it was only about six to eight inches tall. This is a tomato cage on the outside. There's a clothespin right there at the top. And this collar around here, this is really a collar that goes all the way up to the top of the tomato cage and encloses the eggplant. It's about two feet tall and flea beetles can't jump that high. We lowered the collar so that you could see the plant and see what good shape it's in. You can leave the collar up for as long as you want to because eggplants are self-pollinating. They do not have to have a pollinator come for you to get fruit. Now this is an eggplant we put in at the same time in another part of the garden that did not have any physical barriers. And you can see what happened to it. The poor little thing got eaten up by flea beetles. The plant is stunted, it's discolored, and eventually it just died and we had to pull it out. Another thing we did in another corner of the garden is we built a hoop house. We covered the entire house with row cover. And this slide over here, we planted in the hoop house, in the center were our brassicas. On the outside, we planted spicy greens. Now the spicy greens were put there to deter the rabbits because the rabbits will eat almost anything, but they didn't really care for the spicy greens. So that kept them out of our hoop house and the cover kept the flea beetles out. For chemical controls, you can spray with surround WP, which is really just a kaolin clay. It forms a protective barrier on the leaves and evidently those little flea beetles don't like chomping through it. It must make their teeth all gritty because they'll leave it alone. It also makes your plants all white. There are some organic insecticides and yes, these are termed as organic. You just need to follow the directions. The directions for their use are on the products. It just needs to be very closely observed so that you don't harm any of your beneficial insects. I feel that if you can control these insects with physical barriers, then you really have won the war. The Mexican bean beetle. Whew, boy, did they cause us a lot of problems last year. Who would believe that this incredibly destructive pest could be related to the lady beetle, which is one of our favorite beneficial insects that we really like to see in the garden. The lady beetle keeps aphids, mealybugs, mites, scale, and whitefly under control, whereas the Mexican bean beetle just gets totally out of control. The Mexican bean beetle looks a lot like the lady beetle, 
but has slightly different coloring and markings. And you'll be able to easily differentiate the two after you've had a few encounters with them. If you get Mexican bean beetles, you usually have more than just a few encounters. Again, their life cycle will help us understand how to control them. The Mexican bean beetles overwinter as adults in the ground. When the weather warms up, they emerge, and this is usually from mid to late spring. Now, they're pretty hungry, so they just head straight for the food source that they can find. And as soon as they find what they're looking for, they start to lay their eggs. They lay little eggs on the underside of the leaves, depositing between 40 and 60 yellow eggs standing on end, just like little soldiers of destruction, which is what they are. After they hatch, they have four stages of larvae. And even though they only produce one generation a year, they lay eggs all season long, and all stages of larvae and the adults feed on your plants. So they can produce a lot of beetles. Now the eggs look very similar to ladybug beetles, and they hatch in five to 14 days. Then emerging larvae go and join the adults in eating the plants. These guys just grow and grow, and soon they'd start to develop lots of little black spines, make them look hairy. In two to five weeks, the larvae will then pupate, and the pupae are yellow. They attach themselves to the back of the leaf. They'll stay in this stage for three to 10 days, and then they emerge as adults. The adults can live for four to six weeks. There is a lot of time that we are infested with bean beetles, Damage from all stages of the Mexican bean beetle can be seen most severely in the summer months. You can see what they do to the leaves. Here's some larvae. You've got different stages. They're relentless. What can we do? Planting early will give you a head start. Look for a variety of bean that is very early maturing. There are some beans that mature in 50 days versus beans that mature in 80 days. Monitor your plants. Check them often. The undersides of the leaves is where you'll find the yellow egg clusters, larvae, and adults. Crush them all by hand. Hand picking is a good thing. Do this as soon as you see any sign of them. Squish as many as you can. This could be therapeutic, I promise. I use a disposable plastic glove just because it makes it a little less yucky. They don't smell and they don't stain, but they do squish yellow and they are sticky. Remove severely affected plants and destroy them. Plant a trap crop. I mentioned this earlier with the squash vine borer, that they prefer the Hubbard squash. Well, in this case, you can plant a trap crop of soybeans. Soybeans will tolerate cooler and wetter weather conditions than regular green beans. So you can plant these earlier than you do your regular beans. Find a place away from where you're planting your beans and put in a little patch of soy. When the adults emerge from the soil, they're going to head straight for the soybeans. Keep an eye on them and when you see that they are laying their eggs and are in the first generation on your soy crop, pull up all those plants with as many adults as you can. Now getting the adults is the tricky part because as soon as they're disturbed, they drop to the ground and play possum. They'll fall on their backs and they hide that orange shell they have, and their underbellies are a dark color that looks like the color of the soil. Now you can catch some of these adults by having a plastic cup with a little bit of soapy water in it. You put the cup underneath the leaf where you see the adult, just tap the leaf and the adult will drop right into it. Pull up all your infected plants and put them in black plastic garbage bags. Tie them up good and tight, and leave them in the sun for at least a couple of weeks. Some folks suggest burning them at this point. I'm just not a big proponent of burning anything. My fear of having a fire get away from me and the thought of putting stuff back into our environment just doesn't appeal to me, but that's a personal opinion. Laura, there's a question about getting soybean plants. I think probably just purchasing some soybean seed is going to be the easiest way of doing that. I have looked for soybean seeds at our local nurseries and not found them available. You have to purchase the little expensive packages that say edamame. Edamame, great. Now you can plant different varieties of beans. North Carolina State University suggests 
the varieties of Wade, Logan, and Black Valentine are less severely damaged by Mexican bean beetles. Now we've got predatory insects. These are the good bugs. This is a spine soldier bug, and it looks a lot like a stink bug and a lot like a squash bug, but this one is really the predator of the Mexican bean beetle, so you don't want to squash this guy. He's on our side. It's really hard to tell the difference between the stink bugs, squash bugs, and the spine soldier bug. But the way you do that is this area right here, the pronotum, is sharp. It's like a little spine. This is where it got its name. And if you take a look at the squash bug or stink bug, the pronotum is rounded. So you really have to look carefully to make sure if you're not squishing one of the good guys. Our next one, the Pediobius foveolatus, the predatory wasp. Here we go, another one of the good guys. These have to be released at the first signs of seeing larvae. You can purchase them online. I haven't looked for them, but other folks have and said that they can find them online. Now I have to tell you, it's taken me three weeks to be able to pronounce Pediobius foveolatus. I did this for you guys. There are a couple chemical controls that you can use. Neem oil affects the insects that are eating the leaves. So it's the leaves that have to be sprayed. Just be cautious and spray only at night. Milky spore will kill the larvae, and it also attacks the grubs of Japanese beetles. So you're really getting a two for one there. Now folks, here are the references. And on that note, I'm going to sign off and say thank you. I hope I've been able to share with you some new ideas and maybe give you a better understanding of how to control some of our garden pests. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. This was great. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want you to be aware that we are moving our Gardening in the Mountains and Saturday Seminar program online, as we've done today. And to find those upcoming dates and topics, just go to mastergardener.org. We want to thank everybody for coming today and hope you stay safe and healthy and enjoy this summer solstice. Be out in the garden and enjoy the beautiful surroundings.